Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Paul, are we good on the live audience as well? Hello, folks out there in the ether. We're happy to have you here this morning. Uh, and also, of course, physically present. Those who are physically present in the room, I'll ask you before we begin to please turn off your cell phones. Any noise-making devices, vuvuzelas, whatever you got, turn them off. And thank you for that. Um, and let us get started. First of all, uh, thank you, Professor Fricker. That was an absolutely fantastic talk. Put our hands together. Uh, I, I said this, this morning I had a first opportunity to engage in blaming and forgiving as my daughter lost the car keys. Uh, we, we covered the first part, we didn't get to the second part yet, so, uh, but it's coming. I also want to thank Chancellor Guskowitz and Dean White for their support, our wonderful advisory board, especially Joe Rytok, who isn't with us today. He's at Marbles Museum, which is a perfect thing to be doing with your grandson today, but uh, all the wonderful work of our advisory board uh, helping us and supporting us. So I want to thank our Adams Fellows for being uh, with us today, uh, bringing their perspectives, and of course, the wonderful work that they're doing for public humanities. All of our sponsors, the Cotton, uh, Cotton Baumberger Group at Morgan Stanley, the North Carolina Iana Society, the College of Arts and Sciences, the Philosophy Department, and of course the General Alumni Association. All of them have been so wonderful throughout the year and of course uh, in this particular program we need to thank the College and the Philosophy Department in particular. Our wonderful staff, Dr. Lloyd Kramer, put your hands together, wonderful, keeps the ships running. Uh, Christy Norris, who runs our K-12 programming, Joanna Sirk-Smith, uh, Kylie Seltzer, Brian Ensminger, Shagufta Hakim, Paul Bonici, and Vicki Breeden. Thank you all for the wonderful work that they do. We want to thank Jill Adams, the daughter of Maynard Adams, who may be in the ether right now. I know she was with us last night. Uh, has been a wonderful supporter of this initiative from the beginning. So thank you, Jill. And of course, great thanks today goes to the Taylor Charitable Trust whose generous support has made the Adams Fellows Project and this weekend symposium possible. Uh, we extend our thanks to the whole Taylor family, Crawford and Marlene and their children, Logan and Merrill, and their families, and we wish they could be with us today, but they want us to know that they are here in spirit, and Crawford did have a chance to watch it last night, so thank you again to the Taylor Charitable Trust. Uh, this event and all the t pro uh, projects that the Taylor Charitable Trust has funded to honor our founder, E. Maynard Adams, and his ideas are a testament to the power of teaching. Crawford spent his first summer after high school in the early 1960s working at the Blue Ridge Institute's summer program in the mountains of North Carolina. And while he was there, he had the opportunity to take courses from a real UNC professor, a mid-career academic named Maynard Adams. Over these summers there, Crawford fell in love not only with his wife Marlene, but with the world of ideas, especially those he learned from Maynard. He continued to study under Maynard when he was accepted to the graduate program in philosophy here at Carolina. And though he didn't con uh, continue his studies through to the PhD, those years were absolutely formative in Crawford's life, during which he became indebted to one particular idea of Adams. And let me read you what he wrote in this pamphlet. In the first page, when we were putting this together, uh, he had written about Maynard Adams uh, that uh, I'll, I'll skip the first part, but always a logician in his first book, Ethical Naturalism and the Modern World View, Maynard argued that feelings and emotions are cognitive. If one finds his arguments compelling, then the underpinnings of the humanities are completely reinvigorated. Our legal system may actually have to do with justice, not just behaviorism. Politics might have to do with what is good, as Socrates framed it, rather than Machiavellian power. And religion may be more about profound love than egocentricity masquerading as divine authority. Clearly, clearly Crawford learned how to write while he was in his uh, uh, studies there. So you can see this is absolutely a powerful idea uh, that we are pursuing today, how our emotions involved and how we work and through this world. Um, just think about that. So thank you, Crawford. 60 years later, that meeting with Maynard in the mountains has led us here today. I would now like to introduce Logan Mitchell one of this year's Adams Fellows, to offer his, uh, their thoughts on how Adams might have approached this weekend's topic. So, Logan Mitchell, come on up.
Thanks. Hi, my name is Logan. I'm a second year philosophy PhD student in the philosophy department here at UNC, and I'm a current Maynard Adams Fellow for the Public Humanities. And my work mostly focuses on ethics and moral psychology. So I got to tell Professor, Professor Fricker that I've been a big fan of her for a long time, but I will repeat it to all of you. And so I'm very excited to welcome her here and connect her ideas to Maynard Adams, who uh, of whom I am uh, a recent fan. I will be totally honest, I had never really heard of him before coming to, to UNC. And I think that's, that, that's true of a lot of philosophers. There's a lot of really influential philosophers that just kind of end up slipping under the radar of like current PhD students. So, uh, so it's delightful to, to learn more, more about him. So he was a very prolific writer. I think something like over a hundred journal articles and six books, which is, which is quite remarkable. And as, as you all know, he was the chair of the philosophy department. He was the chair of the faculty council. Uh, he also was the founding director. Not only, he didn't, not only helped to found Carolina Public Humanities, but um, but UNC's Peace, War, and Defense program, which is very, very uh, popular and very thriving. I know a lot of our uh, philosophy PhD students, We all, a lot of us end up teaching the ethics of peace, war, and defense. Um, yeah, and then, of course, he was a guiding force behind, behind here. Uh, Adams was a, a very staunch critic of what he calls naturalism, which can mean a lot of different things in, in philosophy. But in this sense, it really refers to the idea that that all of the truths about the world can be can be found through the sciences, through and at part through the natural sciences. And he thought this was incorrect because there are things like meaning and value that can be discovered in the in the world, but that they they can't be discovered with a magnifying glass or you know a particle accelerator. I don't know what the whatever those things are. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure some of you. I should have asked um, the dean last night because I think he's like a scientist or something. I really don't know. Um, but but you know and and you know obviously not a calculator. Though I will say a lot of people have tried to do ethics with a calculator, and um, I find it unsatisfying. I have a feeling Professor Fricker probably also does too. Um, but because of this, you know, Adams emphasized the importance of humanities, not only in education, but but as, to society as a whole. That, and as we've seen, how how valuable the humanities are, even to the natural sciences, in informing natural sciences. But as as Adams would be very quick to say, it's not only instrumentally. The humanities aren't only instrumentally valuable in how they inform how you do psychology and whatever kinds of, you know, and, and chemistry, but they have their own intrinsic value. They're valuable for their own sake. And obviously, if you came here at 9 a.m. on a Saturday, I'm sure I don't have to convince you that that's true. Um, but yeah, he thought that that education should not only train humans to be better workers, but that it should train humans to be better humans and to be better citizens and family members and friends. So because of that, I think it's pretty clear how Prof Professor Fricker's work connects to Adams's vision and his commitments. But I'm just going to briefly uh, touch on two little threads that should be very, very easy to, to see between prof Professor, oh my gosh, prof I'm just going to call you Miranda, between Miranda. <laughs> Between, it's too early. It's too early. Um, between Miranda's work and, and Maynard Adams's work. So um, so first, I think that, that Miranda really does an outstanding job of showing us the irreplaceable value of humanistic critical reflection on everyday phenomena in our moral world. It may sound, I think a lot of people, at, for it, you may think, um, well, blame, that's not the kind of thing we really need to think about. We all know what it is. We all do it. We all, it it's the kind of thing that just makes itself known to you. But as we we saw from the talk last night, that's, that couldn't be further from the truth. So often things that seem so obvious to us or seem so easy to grasp, the second you start to investigate the underpinnings and the motivations and the justifications behind them, you, you realize that, that we need exactly this kind of, of critical reflection. And, you know, and there's a lot that science can show us about blame. We can learn about the chemicals that are released in our, in our brain. We can learn about, um, you know, when we can learn about how our nervous systems react when we're angry and when we're feeling loving towards someone. And when we forgive someone, I bet that there's some, you know, I bet serotonin and oxytocin are flowing. And I bet when you're mad, there's a lot of cortisol and adrenaline. You know, we can tell those kinds of stories about blame and we can even do a lot of sociological or psychological experiments and people have done this to see 
you know, do our relationships better when people feel guilt and things, you know, like you can do all those kinds of, of experiments too, but science alone can't tell us what the point of blame is. Science can't tell us what the value of, of blame is. And so Miranda's work by being, by being so illuminating, by being so helpful, it demonstrates the clear limits of purely scientific or, you know, what Adams would call naturalistic reasoning. So just because it was so helpful, if you found the talk helpful, that just sort of proves Adams's point. Because if naturalism was true, the talk yesterday would have just been um, the kind of thing that could have easily been translated into purely scientific terms, which I, I think is, is definitely not true. I don't think that, that that could have been done without losing something really important. And then the second thread I want to touch on is how deeply Miranda's work reflects Adams's commitment to the unique value of, of emotions. So we've talked a little bit about this. This has come up a little bit that, that Adams believed that emotions had a uniquely epistemic value and, and in particular, a moral epistemic value in the sense that emotions could give us information about the moral world. And, and he even thought that, that they could be sort of evidence for particular moral facts that existed in the world. And so for Adams, emotions play a key role in, in what I've referred to as like the moral infrastructure of our society. And it serves as both, emotions serve as both a tool and as information. So they kind of, it plays this, this multiple, these multiple purposes. Um, and as, as Miranda talked about, looking at the function of blame, I think we see that so nicely illustrated in, in Miranda's work because emotions, you know, for Adams, emotions are, could be tools that are used to express and to, to demand and to protest, to give meaning to things, to give value to things. But they were also information, they were data that were filled with, with clues as to the truth about, you know, what we fear, what we crave, what we value most, what is, and for him, that emotions were clues to what is valuable objectively. And Miranda's work so beautifully demonstrates these ideas in action by exploring the ways in which blaming emotions or practices of blame can play in an essential role in our moral ecosystems as we try to, to move towards shared moral understanding like, like she was talking about yesterday. And, you know, so they're used to communicate when norms have been violated, when feelings have been hurt, when expectations have been disappointed. And then even before they're expressed, a lot of blaming emotions or even the impulse to blame can give us insight about our own values and our own, our own selves. And sometimes to the point that it even surprises us. Like I imagine most of us have had a situation where we go, oh my gosh, I got angry about that that's a door that's not a human being or that's a baby or whatever it like oh my good or you got i i got so angry at the fact that my partner like put the strawberries in this place in the fridge instead of this place in the fridge that's wild like why did i get so angry about that or why is it so hard to let this go why is this why is this issue so hard to let go. And Adams would say, that's a clue. That's something that is giving you information about where you're at. And I, I mean, I agree. And I think that, that Miranda's work, work really nicely shows how valuable that information can be as, a, as both the information for your own personal lives, but also as a tool to help motivate communication and to get a dialogue going. And so those are just like a two very brief reasons, because we have a lot of people that are about to talk much more. But those are just two brief reasons why I think that Professor, Professor Miranda Fricker is such, is such a wonderful embodiment of the humanities at our very best. And I think that, that Miranda is someone who Maynard Adams would be absolutely thrilled to to welcome to Chapel Hill and to engage in, in a discussion with. So with that, um, let the panel commence. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Logan. You, you definitely brought Maynard in here, and, and as it ought to be, as Maynard would say. So please, we invite our first panelist to come up. You all have microphones there. You may clip them on or just pick them up and hold them. You may sit behind your name if you so choose. That would probably be helpful. Um, and uh, I want to let everyone know we have bios here, and you can read the full bios because we want to make sure that we can maximize the amount of time that we have. So I will not be reading bios, but I will say a few reasons why we have uh, unique perspectives on this issue. So on our panel today, as you can see, we have Ricky Hurtado, who has uh, spent time in the North Carolina House of Representatives and is an advocate for the Latinx community. Um, so certainly from the perspective of politics and from advocacy, you can see there's a lot to discuss about blaming and forgiving. Um, each of our, uh, both of our panels will have a philosopher on them. So Delaney Thol is our philosopher here. And I'll just say to give a philosophical retort or a response. So, uh, and then uh, uh, finally, we also want to welcome Ronald Carnes, uh, who has uh, experience with both the carceral system in the United States and of course for advocacy as well, areas in which there are lots of uh, discussion for blame and forgiveness. So enough about me and please welcome our first panel. Whoever would like to start. So why don't we start Great. <laughs> I always love this roulette. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ricky Hurtado, and uh, I drove 30 minutes here from right next door, Alamance County, um, to share a little bit about my thoughts on, on the topic of, of blaming and forgiving. Um, you all had me thinking critically on a Friday night and Saturday morning, so I guess that's just a testament to how much I love Carolina. <laughs> I'm an alum here. Um, <laughs> And uh, I appreciate the space to sort of reflect on my own journey in politics uh, next door, but also just these broader topics of how we begin to build bridges in communities. Um, this topic for me immediately took me back to just uh, to my own personal story. And I, and I want to begin there because for me, um, it would not be possible for me to sit in front of you and, and discuss <laughs> philosophize right on, on a topic such as blaming and forgiving without a systemic forgiveness that happened 40 plus years ago um, or about 40 years ago uh, that impacted my family. My, both of my parents are uh, immigrants or I would argue and call them refugees from El Salvador from Central America and in the 80s fled a civil war uh, that directly impacted um, their family. Uh, my parents are both 20 years old and literally just crossed the border in the trunk of a car. And that for us was the beginning of our family story. I was not born yet, but without that sort of moment of courage and just that moment of, of, of survival for, for my mom and dad, um, the Hurtado family never happens, right? It doesn't happen in the way it does. And it doesn't lead us to then move from LA and California where I was born to, to North Carolina uh, and this moment of forgiveness that I'm referring to is comprehensive immigration reform, right? Uh, when you think about amnesty that impacted almost 3 million people in, in the United States, that was, I mean, quite literally what amnesty means, right? An, an act of forgiveness uh, for, for um, and we can argue sort of the merits of all that, but that moment for us led us to a moment where their children were safer, where their family was uh, had an opportunity to really engage in a, in a brave new world, right? And so fast forward now, right? Uh, and, and so much of that story for me um, and the topics of forgiveness have sort of motivated me to stay engaged in the community and perhaps naively get engaged in politics over the last few years. Uh, when you think about some of the broader topics um, and policy issues that are impacting a place like Alamance County. Um, and so staying on the topic of immigration for a second, this topic has been something that uh, was a quite a foil for my candidacy in 2020 when I ran for office. We had a big national topic of something like immigration and the Trump presidency and administration and what all that meant in an era of anti-immigrant rhetoric and policy that was directly impacting families in North Carolina where we were consistently seeing raids uh, in, in communities across, not just the state, but across the country. Um, and in Alamance County, I was fighting to become the first 
Latino Democrat in the history of North Carolina to ever win an election. Uh, and so the media was really eager to sort of set up this foil of what my candidacy meant for the broader conversation around immigration. And it was particularly significant in Alamance County because there, there is a narrative that you can very quickly find if you Google Alamance County and the local sheriff's department around the tension between the immigrant community and the sheriff's department. And so in 2012, the sheriff's department was sued by the Department of Justice for racial profiling of immigrants and Latinos in the community. Um, and this has left a huge sore mark in the community, right? Um, you fa he, was, uh, he was acquitted, the sheriff, um, and sort of there's a lot of factors that went into that case, not, not sort of rectifying some of the challenges in the community, but you fast forward 15 years and, and sort of the, the character and the challenges that were once so 15 years ago are, I don't want to say they're gone, but it's certainly shifted, right? Uh, it's the same sheriff that's been there for 20 plus years. Uh, but many of the policies and tactics that were in place whenever this uh, lawsuit occurred, right, are no longer in place. But you can feel you can you can uh, it's you can feel the blame in the community for anything that happens, any sort of digression that happens against the, uh, the Latino immigrant community that in any way, shape or form is connected to law enforcement. It's people immediately go back to that moment. Right. And, and so for for me, it's difficult. Right. As someone who has built a reputation in Alamance County of trying attempting to be a bridge builder. Right on how do you rectify sort of this moment where there's even a refusal when law enforcement or the sheriff's office, for example, requests a meeting with the Latino community to sort of engage in dialogue, right? How do we sort of rectify the sins of the past where the community is like, we don't want to have that conversation. Like we still feel like we've never <laughs> received that forgiveness, right? Or, or that we deserve um, some sort of um, gift in the sense of, um, Reconciliation, reconciliation for all the damage that has happened, right? Um, and so that is a tension that I consistently navigate in, in the local community. And that sort of tension exists on a number of different issues in Alamance County when you think about just the broader racial tension in the community, when you think about a Confederate monument that I can walk to five minutes from my house and sort of everything that that symbolizes for the community where in the last few years there have been protests in the middle of, our, of the county square um, again, a very Googleable <laughs> incidents have happened in the square when you talk about clashes between law enforcement and, and, and protesters um, and just the general activism around the monument. And you begin to re very much realize that there's so much more under the surface than just the relocation or removal of a monument, right? It's stories about uh, blame, it's stories about forgiveness, it's a story about how the community has interacted for so many generations, quite frankly. And the fact that we refuse to continue to have refuse to have this conversation collectively as a community. Uh, now, in, in recent memory, there's been efforts to try to have this conversation. Uh, and so much of my time in office over the last, um, between 2020 and, and 2022, was not about policy, but it was actually about these interactions between communities. It was actually around who shares some of this blame for sort of where our communities are and, and how do we get to a point of forgiveness. But the pressure is consistently in a place like Alamance County on the victims to forgive and never on the perpetrators, the wrongdoers, to sort of think about how they rectify sort of the sins of the past. Um, and so that's sort of where we're at right now, right, as a community. And there's so much more to unpack there. Um, I want to let uh, my colleagues here sort of begin with their remarks as well. But it, it's interesting for me, I'll close with this, that these efforts for me continue to start and stop and fail in many ways. Uh, whenever we think about, I mean, there's like, I guess in the national rhetoric, we're talking about reparations, right? That's sort of one of the topics of conversation. We're talking about a number of things that have a policy prescription to it, but it seems like in the General Assembly, it seems like in our local communities, we want to skip over the conversation around blame and forgiveness. And it seems really critical uh, and something I just didn't really realize before getting into politics that so much of that work was relational and not transactional. And so that the work of politics is actually the work of, of sort of finding that forgiveness to be able to move forward, to actually have robust discussions around what are actually some of these policy prescriptions to be able to sort of wrong some of the uh, past sins in our community. And so, yeah, we, we, we continue to move that work forward, but, you know, it's home. So we'll continue doing that for as long as we need to. Uh, 
Oh, great. Thanks, Max. Um, and thanks for sharing that, Ricky. Yes, of course. Example um, of the kind of thing I think Rand is interested in. Uh, I'll give us a few more philosophical tools. Not that we didn't get enough last night, um, but I hope to kind of raise a question, uh, maybe a little bit of a challenge, um, but I think it's one of these, these questions or these challenges that really comes up when doing the kind of public work of blame and forgiveness, especially with communities who've experienced a lot of injustice or who are living under oppression or who aren't taken seriously for one reason or another. So the question I've kind of been thinking about um, in response to Miranda is about the balance between evaluating moral emotions like blame on their function versus on their value and what they contribute um, to well-being in ways that maybe don't have anything to do with how well they succeed at doing moral work. Uh, so I'll, I'll say some about, um, about that tension and what I mean by it. So Miranda's account is amazing, kind of Logan was talking about this, about sort of saying like, let's do some data gathering. Um, what is the good stuff that blame and forgiveness helps us do? What moral work does it accomplish in our lives together? And then once we've kind of identified the set of moral work that it does, uh, Miranda argues that we get to then kind of decide which kinds of blame stick around or get to stay, which ones we're gonna keep. Um, and that's the part I wanna push back on because if we're just going to keep blame or just going to keep some version of blame or forgiveness based on how well it does moral work for us, um, we might miss out on some of the value that comes with experiencing blame or experiencing forgiveness in the fullness of um, what it means for you, kind of in the internal, in your internal experience or the story you have about your own life. Um, so why does this distinction matter? I think it really comes up... Um, when you look at how well people are able to do that kind of moral work with each other based on who they are or the position they have in the world. So Miranda brought up some great examples of this about how um, there was one passage, I think, in her talk last night about how people used to think the anger of women or of poor people um, or of children was funny because, like, who are they to be angry? Um, and that, and, you know, we don't think that today. We tend to... to be a lot more inclusive about uh, who we think is a moral agent and who we're going to engage with. Um, but that kind of dynamic where some people aren't permitted to do moral work as equals because of who they are in the world um, is exactly where it matters, um, where it's like you want to be able to say, okay, you can still do blaming um, or still perhaps experience the full benefits of forgiveness even if you fail to accomplish the moral work that blame or forgiveness might be valued for. Um, and that failure to accomplish that moral work uh, might not be any failure on your own part if you're just not permitted to do moral work in the first place. Um, so this, this comes up uh, out of the work of a philosopher, Amiya Srinivasan, who I'm, I'm sure Miranda is very familiar with, but she draws us a, a distinction um, that other philosophers kind of think about as well between emotions, moral emotions like blame um, or anger as being apt or fitting versus being right. So something might be right because it is apt or fitting in some way, it's suitable. Um, it ought to be like that to use, to, to use Maynard Adams language. Um, but rightness also has baked into it kind of pragmatic stuff, perhaps, about what you accomplish with it. So it might be right to feel angry, but if it's going to be really hurtful towards someone in your community to enact that anger, perhaps on the whole, it would be wrong for you to kind of be angry or live in the space of anger or um, to fully experience emotion in that way. And Srinivasan and other philosophers who are worried about this aptness or fittingness idea um, are pushing us to say, like, well, you know, it might be wrong, all things considered, for you to, to experience emotion in the full, in the full force of it, um, because it might not be pragmatic for your community moving forward, um, it might lead you to be resentful, um, but in those cases, there's still something really apt or fitting, especially in the face of injustice or oppression, about allowing yourself to experience the full force of the emotion, um, kind of you know, setting aside the question of whether what it does in the world or the work that it accomplishes or whether or not um, whether or not it 
helps you uh, reach kind of moral rightness or um, something like that in your relationships. So the question is, um, how much of this project is about us becoming the kind of people who don't get it wrong, who've like arrived at the set, the range of what blame is, is helpful or permissible or successful in our lives, and then shaping ourselves, our inner character, um, our communities and our institutions in accord with those good, successful, um, morally helpful kinds of blame. How much of this project is about moving in that direction versus how much of this project is about just appreciating that blame does moral work um, and holding that alongside the other kinds of value that something like blame could have in our lives. So you might think that blame has a kind of expressive value, um, that it's important to just uh, authentically express with force um, how you've experienced something or how you're feeling, and that that's a separate you know, part of the puzzle of what's morally relevant about blame. Um, or you might think there's there's something kind of like aesthetic or um, experientially value about, valuable about blame, like maybe it teaches you something about um, the moral fabric of the universe, or um, yeah, it's an important experience to have as part of a human life. Um, in some ways, these are kinds of moral moral work, but it's different than the kind of interpersonal, what does it take to move this relationship forward in a healthy way kind of moral work. So. Should we become the kind of people who only experience blame uh, when it lets us do moral work with each other or in our communities? Or is it good that we have this kind of fuller um, set of moral emotions at our disposal, but that we should think carefully, especially in situations like the ones Ricky is describing in public life, where you, know, you might value blame in its fullness, but decide in certain contexts that you need to, to do that moral work in certain ways or with only certain kinds of blame or certain kinds of forgiveness. So thank you, Miranda, for bringing these ideas. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, this has been an amazing two days for me. Uh, I'm not used to hanging out with philosophers. <laughs> The philosophers in my in my upbringing were my grandmother and my great grandfather, who always had a nice little quote for anything you did that was stupid. <laughs> uh, I was born June the second, nineteen forty-five. Two months later, uh, President Truman bombed Hiroshima. It ended the war. Uh, men started coming back home. Before then, the families, colored families, had been used to surviving, being under uh, assault, trying to make sure that the families in the area we lived in where I was born, it was called uh, The Ville. This was in St. Louis, Missouri. And I was born in a hospital, Homer G. Phillips. At the time, it was uh, the best training hospital in a color community any place in the United States. And uh, I learned all this later, of course. Um, my memories of that time, and I have to give you a little history to get you to understand how I'm going to tie my history into what we're talking about here. Uh, I, my deepest memories about my childhood were the lessons I learned listening to my grandmother, the women in my community, uh, Sergeant Parker, the uh, local cop that lived in the neighborhood, walked the beat, took care of everybody in the community. And everybody kind of looked out for Sergeant Parker. You know, we loved the guy. There weren't many white cops that came down to our community in a way that was kind of a blessing. 
we resolved our problems, we took care of our issues, Sergeant Parker took care of that. I learned about, uh, growing up, learned about how to feed a community, how to feed a family, how to protect a family. I guess that's where I learned this, I developed this attitude about protecting women, protecting children. My grandmother made it, made sure that I understood the important facts about life. Like last night we talked about, uh, I'm sorry, forgive me, but I'm going back to memories I hadn't thought about before. When we talk about blame, blaming someone, I would be under the table listening to my grandmother talk to some of the younger women in the community. And some of the stories would really be horrifying and develop anger in me. And my grandma would tell me, until you know the whole story, you keep your mouth shut because you don't know what all is involved. I took these lessons and I took them personally. It was what I found out later, my way of preparing me for life, the life that we lived in my community. The bill was pretty considering that nobody had money. Well, there was money, the hustlers, the gamblers, the gangsters say what you want about them, but they made sure that money flowed through the community. When somebody needed food or we'd have to have a rent party for somebody to pay for their rent, the people that had the money, they made sure that it spread around. They would buy groceries. The cabbies would have uh, the means to take groceries to people's houses. We had horses when I was young. The ice man would bring, you know, ice, just walk right into your house with a block of ice on his shoulder. Morning, everybody, throw the ice in the ice box and walk on out. And I would love it because that'd be my chance to go out and talk, talk to the horse. <laughs> Trained horse, he would walk from house to house and he would stop. And the guy that was hauling ice, he would run up to the back of his wagon, pull off a block of ice, go upstairs, and the ice man had carte blanche in everybody's house. He could just walk in and walk out, you know. Same thing with the milkman, another horse. <laughs> the vegetable, uh, the guy that brought vegetables through the community, he had a wagon and a horse. There were ways for the colored families to survive. People understood what was needed to raise kids, to keep them healthy, to keep them out of the hospital. It was a community that was under siege constantly. So survival, being versatile was important. And around the 50s, beginning of the early 50s, they started the period where they wanted to disassemble the, the Ville, the black community. Uh, they started with Homer G. Phillips Hospital. Different politicians were trying to figure a way to dismantle the hospital, stop the programs, shut down Homer G. Phillips. It took them about 25 years before they finally got it done, but that was the life we lived in. Things, one of my good memories, we had a Jewish family that owned a store in the community. Good people. They let us get food, they put it on the books, and We'd pay it off when we could. But they knew everybody in the community. They knew all the kids in the community. And uh, they weren't the kind of people that preach to you or what have you, you know. 
They'd be glad to see you and you'd be glad to see them. Now, I'm telling you this to give you an idea of how I was brought up and the mentality and the atmosphere. I left home at 16. Uh, let me go back further. My mother and father divorced when I was a year old. My grandmother raised me. My mother went to Chicago. Uh, my grandmother was a barmaid. She worked in one of the most popular black bars in St. Louis. I met all the musicians. Louis Armstrong, Zoot Sims, Sarah, <laughs> uh, Ella Fitzgerald, all of them. And uh, my memory was always full of these gifted people. And the majority of them all had a soft spot for the children, not just me, all the kids. And because my grandmother worked in the bar, I could go into the bar, get a Coca-Cola, sit on, sit up there with the big folks, you know. But my exposure to the life of being black or colored at that time, it was full and rich. I felt protected. I felt loved. And people took the time to teach me things that I needed to know. I was not stupid. I was a pretty smart kid. I could figure things out. And I always had, like my great granddaddy used to tell me, if you don't open your mouth, nobody will know how stupid you really are. <laughs> so I learned how to sit and be quiet and listen. And that was passed down to uh, seem like everybody in my family had that attitude. When I got to be 16, my mother had come back to uh, St. Louis and uh, I was living with her. We started a bar. Well, she started a bar and of course, being one, you know, one of the sons. My little brother had just been born. He was six years old. My mother waited 10 years before she had another child. Then she waited another 10 years before she had a daughter. So all of us kids are 10 years apart. Anyway, back to the story. <laughs> uh, I never learned that much about my father and I never had much of a fatherly upbringing. Most of my training as a child was given to me by my grandmother, my mother, my aunts, my cousins, they spoiled the hell out of me. The men in my family were hustlers, gamblers, gangsters, and uh, they kept an eye on me. Sergeant Parker kept an eye on me. And I grew up with a healthy respect. There comes a time in your life where you get to do that stupid thing that you don't have any business doing. You know, I was always curious, had no problem with getting up and going someplace to travel. Uh, a lot of the things that I was involved in, I didn't realize how important they were until after I had grown up. Lived in D.C., uh, worked for a consulting firm, ended up being a part of Title IX. I didn't find that out until mid-70s but we were just collecting research. I'm really proud of that part of my life. And that was also how I ended up doing a lot of political work. I enjoyed campaigns, uh, developed a pretty good sense about politics. 
and I always led by example. I didn't preach. I don't like preaching to people. Nobody preached to me. If there was something that had to be done, you go. You went and did it. And uh, in my day and age, there wasn't a lot of forgiveness. It wasn't one of the terms. They, my grandmother made sure that I went to church. And that was, uh, okay, that was uh, Reverend Williams Church in St. Louis, Christ Pilgrim Rest. That's why I asked you about that. Um, you've read my bio, you know about my history, so I won't get into that too much. I've been type of person that uh, I deal with problems. I don't consider blaming someone because working in a bar, you feed alcohol to people that have problems to make their problems worse and listen to people blame everybody under the sun but themselves. So blame for me was never something that I even considered. If we, if I had a problem, I wouldn't dealt with it. How do you get around this problem other than not ever doing it again? Grandmother used to say, if you're walking on a track and you're a train coming, you need to get out of the way. <laughs> if you don't get out of the way, then you're gonna have to suffer what happens. That's what happened to me in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Got ran over by a train, but I survived. I've been to, lived in Mexico, Mexico lived in Puerto Rico, lived in San, uh, Dominican Republic. I've swam in both of the oceans, three of the uh, Great Lakes. Uh, I went to school for electronic engineering helped install the uh, first digital electronic switching system in the United States. Uh, I've been busy, but I never let blame tie me down. I never had that time to do that. I developed my character, I'm loyal. I try to tell the truth as much as I possibly can. I tell you, I hold my friends close and I don't deal with forgiveness. I don't see, for me, because of the way I've been brought up, the way I raised, was raised, the way I've lived my life, forgiveness is nothing that uh, I want to put too much time in. It brings back too many bad memories. To this day, I still remember looking at the picture of Emmett Till in 55, and that was 66 years ago. And uh, I'll never forgive anyone that would do something like that. And there's a number of other things that have happened since then, but my attitude about blame and forgiveness, it just wasn't a part of my curriculum, I'm sorry, you know. Everybody has their own thing. That's not mine. I, I just constantly look at what's next and how do we get around this, get it done. We are going to uh, uh, thank uh, wonderful three perspectives on this. We're going to give Professor Fricker a chance to respond to some of these comments, and then we'll open up uh, in the last 10 minutes or so for questions from the audience for our panel. So would you like to respond? OK. Thank you so much um, for all your, am I not switched? Yeah, oh, yeah, I am switched on. Oh. oh my goodness. Oh, <laughs>
I mean, I, I won't be able to do justice at all. I'll just say a little something, and we all want this to be a much more collective conversation, and I did a lot of talking yesterday, but thank all three of you so much. A, a really general thing I wanted to say that actually does connect with each of the different things you all three said is that, for me, one of the... I'm sort of always interested in the negatives of things, and in a way, one of the most interesting things to me about the whole kind of script of blaming and forgiving when we suffer wrongdoing is what its limitations are um and i feel like each of you have drawn our attention to the limitations well you know limits it's fine in its place it's fine for some it's fine for some context but it won't do for every context and it's not compulsory that that's what i'm thinking about limits and limitations and i was thinking um maybe in reverse order ron i i really uh, respect and hear what you say about you know it is it is it's not compulsory it's possible to not really think in those terms and I think it would be is a kind of um, in philosophy there's a, and in moral philosophy there's a lot of what I would call moralism which is thinking that taking up specifically moral attitudes and moral responses to things is somehow everywhere all of the time forgetting that there might be lots of reasons or explanations why one doesn't go there sometimes it's because it's too painful and because actually blaming and forgiving individuals in particular it's different when it's sort of whole systems but it's really demanding <laughs> you pay a lot of attention to the people that hurt you especially perhaps in forgiving and maybe one doesn't want to do that and in lots of contexts it doesn't yield fruit and it's not the attitude one wants to take and it's better to sort of disengage and people will have lots of different reasons for that and I wholly respect that. Um, so yes, that's one kind of limitation for this, this pattern of emotions that is very typical in other contexts. Um, and did I have an easel a little? Um, so yes, um, and Delaney, um, thinking about you know, how, you were asking how how great an idea would it be really to drop all the forms of blame that aren't the morally functional, productive ones. And in a way, I, I think I I, I totally um, you know agreed with everything you said because the the bigger kind of philosophical picture of this that I'm trying to write about is um, actually I've got a really kind of boring everyday conception of both blaming and forgiving. I feel like our normal kind of platitudes about what they actually are, are kind of true. So I, I, but I also think everyone seems to have different ideas about what's obviously true. And that's why I don't think you, we'd ever get a philosophical definition of what is it to blame, certainly not blame, probably not what is it to forgive either, which would satisfy everyone. Cause I think actually we all use these words in different ways and there are many different actual practices and conceptual practices out there. So in the philosophical literature, you've got people saying, well, I reckon the main thing is we're protesting or the main thing is we're severing a relationship to make up for the kind of rupture in the moral relations they've shown because of how they were bad to us oh it's always angry or it needn't be angry or and there's just this it's like this kind of it's as if philosophy gets busy doing its normal thing of let's define and then we'll find counterexamples. and i sort of want to say well you're all wrong and you're all right there's, these all are very recognizable descriptions of real practices in the world and real ways people think about these things and one of the uh divisions is whether you know real blame always involves some kind of hostile emotion or not and of course you can think oh yeah that's really typical it is really typical but i also think that i read a newspaper and i read some story about where some official was mildly corrupt and i think oh yeah they were to blame but i'm not feeling any emotion but i think i'm blaming and i think um i think i said this at the d dinner table last night I, I think it's it's therefore important to be kind of minimalist about what blaming is. And I would say it's just finding fault with someone, oneself or another, for something they've done or haven't done, thought or haven't thought. It's finding fault is a thing. And so we're always doing that. And that, that, that's just kind of recording our perception of the world, our moral perception of the world. Um, it may or may not have emotional content. We may or may not choose to communicate it. Certainly, it can. It, it'll be apt if someone was at fault for what they're doing. Uh, but whether you communicate it or not, whether that's a good idea or whether that's enriching or cathartic or negative, that's all depends on the context. Um, and so, yes, if one wants to put it in terms of sort of aptness 
versus is it a good idea to express it? I quite agree with that. I perhaps just like to add that I think, um, you know, there can be lots of, um, lots of different sorts of values that attend a practice. So I definitely wasn't trying to say like the only value. I was kind of trying to say the main value and what we basically want to do. But there can be lots of other kinds of value in having a space in which to express completely unreasonable rage or whatever it is, cathartic spaces. Again, moral relating isn't the only kind of relating. Moral value isn't the only kind of value. There can be aesthetic value which may go against moral value or it may coincide with it and just catharsis and therapeutic and connection making yes we hate those guys those, you know so there's lots of different kinds of value that attend these things so i was trying to focus on what's the moral use you know and the sort of backstory is i'm just very against retributive conceptions of things i just don't see the moral use so thank you so much um for that and and ricky thank you so much um I, uh, one of the things I sort of heard in what you were saying was again about the limitations of blaming because you were talking about uh, bridge building. And perhaps I, perhaps this I might convert into a specific question, though I, I hope any of you might, might want to answer it, but it's, you know, because it's generally about the limitations of blaming and forgiving. Did, did you, maybe it's two questions, do you, do you feel like in, in order for there to be more successful bridge building of the kind you're doing, um, there needs to be a proper space opened up for grievance, as it were, grievances to be aired. So we could put that in terms of blame or not, who cares? But it's about people being having a proper opportunity to say how it was to be for the community to be to be persecuted in that way and to get that onto the table um before bridge building can happen because just thinking again of this experience in Colombia it just like goes back again and again and again everyone has to have a chance to say have their say not just around their own table because it's got to be in public or the relevant public so that you get that acknowledgement so I was wondering how much you felt it's possible to make that well that it's necessary to make that happen and how far you felt it was possible to make that happen I do feel like it's necessary. Um, what I'm trying to determine in a not so formal way is like, what is that public square, right? Is it individual conversations between people? Because so much of what I hear and when I hear it is when you're at someone's door, right? Like when you like literally the like the basics of campaigning where you knock on someone's door and you're asking them what's on their mind, if you if you have their support, et cetera. And so for me, so much of the conversation often happens there, right? When folks open up to, but in a more formal sort of collective sense, uh, at least some communities are engaging in a more public, a very public process to allow those grievances to be aired out. There's power dynamics here, right? Where I feel like in a place like Alamance County, the, um, the scope of the blame right there's a lot of defensiveness to that right in terms of like well we had nothing to do with that right and i think there is limitations in that in terms of like how it's received versus how it's interpreted as well so um yeah i think that in theory and on paper absolutely yes in practice right i think it's the messiness of it all because there are so much emotions tied to this very public airing out of grievances where folks have not given it the proper space to let it breathe right now. Thank you for uh, Panelists, if you would like to respond to anything Professor Fricker said, you have an opportunity and then we'll open up the floor to questions. Any, no response? Okay, let's open up the floor to questions. Mel. Uh, first, I'd like to, to thank all our panelists this morning. Um, and Particularly in listening to Ricky and to Ronald, I am really amazed at the depth of your memory. And Ronald, I could actually see the movie playing in front of you as you were talking. Um, I wonder how much memory and forgetting inform our discussion of blame and forgiveness. The, the trope is forgive and forget, how much can people really forgive and forget 
when our lives are basically walking through the world accumulating memories and incidents that are blameworthy. Yeah, I'll, I'll respond really quickly with, with a quick story. Um, this was actually on top of mind as I reflected on this topic because um, I spoke at a church pretty recently um, right after the election um, last year and it, two black elders came up to me. We were having sort of a small breakfast discussion to talk about how they they understand why the community is having this collective conversation around the Confederate monument and racial equity and, and a number of things. And they certainly didn't disagree with it, but they said, we've lived here for 70 years and this was not a topic of conversation mm -hmm. for us, right? And so there is there was this sort of like acknowledgement of like for us, it was a forgive and forget, right? Like we had endured enough pain and we didn't, we drove by the square every day. I had no idea what that statue was. But then there's sort of this chapter of forget, forgiving and forgetting, and then a younger generation wanting to unearth that, unlock those memories again, and be like, no, actually, there's a discussion to have here. And this may not have indirectly impacted us or directly impacted us, but collectively, right, it is impacting our community. Um, and so that's sort of the tension we're experiencing, whether you also see a generational shift right now in who wants to have that conversation and who just wants to completely forget about it. Ronald is uh, very interesting, and uh, you clearly haven't forgotten anything, but you also said you're not interested in forgiveness. What is your relationship to, do you have a, a way of defining what your relationship is to past grievances if it's not forgetting and not forgiving? Uh, mine is sort of a mechanism that I've developed. Um, kind of relates to this, you have all my respect when we meet. That respect deteriorates depending upon how you show yourself to me. And if you do something to me that bothers me or I feel that I need to stay away from this person, it's not an issue. I just stop talking to you. And I pass by you when I see you. You know, you wave up, and I'm going about my business. That eliminates the possibility of me being harmed by something that you may or may not say or do, and I may have to jump up and try to help and defend you. I won't be involved in that because there's something about you that's not right. I'm not saying you, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I feel seen. Right. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mechanism. And I've used that uh, particularly after 1973. It was a part of my survival, considering all the places I had to go. You know, this reminds a discussion at the dinner table last night when we talked about rising above it. Um, Professor Fricker, could I ask you to, what is the relationship, if you're hearing how Ronald handles that in the relationship between that discussion we had about rising above it and maybe capitulating on this transaction of forgiveness, do you have any thoughts to add to that? Or putting you on the spot? Thank you, yes, no, totally on the spot. Um, I, I, um, the, the, the way I'm, understanding that you're talking about um you know it's com completely brilliant survival mechanism i totally hear what you're saying about that's how you do it it's it's a bit like um um when the world keeps assaulting you you've, you've got to learn to when to engage and when not to engage and you develop a sixth sense for where to go and what to know. It's like, you, like you're saying, your grandmother saying, if there's a train coming, get out of the way. <laughs> and the world is full of trains. So you just, I mean, there wouldn't be time or energy and it wouldn't be, you know, you don't want to dignify the assaults by engaging morally, perhaps. It's like, it's more like full of natural forces that are to be avoided. And um, I, if I'm understanding you rightly, I, I mean, I. I totally get that, and it's uh, it's it sounds like an, a really fine survival mechanism, and it's it's 
so you sorry. You, I'm so sorry you had to do it that way. But yeah. Floor is open for more questions. Okay, we'll go to Brent and then come to Bob. And of course, I want to remind online audience that they can put questions into the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, and I'll be able to get to those as well. This question in my mind didn't come up till about 30 seconds ago, but in observing the group here, when we normally have programs, most people are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. There's a few of us here in our 70s. But Ronald, you're the oldest one on the panel. The other two are considerably younger. What what advice, as far as blame and forgiveness, would you give to the younger group here? Because we've definitely got two almost separate groups. The older people normally come to programs. The younger people are mainly students. But what is your take being older and more wise, I presume? <laughs> Pardon me. It's funny that you bring that up. Uh, last night, the thought ran across my mind when you were talking about uh, your work in South America and Colombia. And the first thing popped in my mind was novellas. And I could never understand how anybody, here we call them soap operas. But <laughs> I could never understand how Somebody could sit there and go through the emotions that these novellas and soap operas put you through. <laughs> and, you know, I'd sit there and drink coffee and I would watch people and how they would respond to all of this stuff. So I guess my advice would be stay away from novellas, <laughs> stay away from the soap operas. But try to go back and understand what your ancestors went through to survive. There's a lot of knowledge in what your people utilize for survival. And that is the key, surviving. I'm a big uh, supporter of our youngsters, and I didn't say kids, our <laughs> youngsters. I got a bad habit because of my age. I really want to see, and I have seen a lot of our youngsters standing up, voicing their opinion, and taking over, and talking to each other. There's a lot of kids out there that aren't doing anything but wandering around in all this ether that's causing them problems. But I still believe that our youth are gonna save us from all this madness we're going through. And uh, keep at it, guys. As long as they don't lose the car keys. Okay, here is <laughs> My issue is more around relationship issues. It feels to me that the issue of blame goes into th at least three categories. One is where you're talking about criminal behavior and the appropriate way of dealing with blame is to take them to court and send them to jail or deal with criminal proceedings, which I would define as in the absence of any relationship between the two parties. Think Jeffrey Epstein, think Harvey Weinstein, think of when someone's been raped or murdered. Someone has no relationship other than this and does not accept any responsibility. Category two is your intermediate. And you just sort of steer around them. You don't like the way they talk. You don't like the way they think. You just don't engage and you don't get very much into a relationship. The key part for me is the relationship issue. The example that was used last night was when a friend lies to you. The emphasis was put on the lie, the content of what the disruption in the relationship is, not the disruption. My issue is saying, if the person lied, the history behind what they feel, like they can't say, I'm ashamed, and I lied because I'm ashamed of what is the content of the lie, I'm ashamed. This party that receives the lie is saying, I'm hurt that you didn't trust and know that our friendship could abide whatever this disruption is. 
The lie is inconsequential. It's the disruption caused by the lie and the psychological loss. If the two parties can put what they were feeling out there, my hypothesis is the whole thing melts away. You don't care anymore about the lie. You care about the disruption in the relationship in a trusted, caring way. Now, I come at it from a psychological dimension, not a philosophical one. So I'm curious how these two fit together, at least in Dr. Fricker's or the panel's angle on this. Um, why don't I do this? Why don't I give Professor Fricker a chance to respond to that, and then we'll open it up to the panel if they have response to that as well. Thank you. Um, so, I don't think I, I um, don't think I disagree with anything you said. That I think you know, when in a personal situation, when say one fr friend has lied to another, um, I agree that um, on the whole. It, you know, it's the fact of the lying, it's not anything in the content of the lie. Though, of course, some, some lies could be particularly awful to tell. I can't believe you lied to me about that. <laughs> um, and then, so it's the relationship that needs mending, and that, that seems quite right to me. May, maybe I could just make a comment about, you know, I, I don't feel at all sort of equipped really to, you know, I, I very much do interpersonal ethics and I feel like I know how to handle that and move around it theoretically and using literature and so on. I have a lot of thoughts about criminal law but I'm not remotely expert in it. And there's lots of people who say do moral philosophy or do criminal law and they assume that the, the two are parallel so that basically the proper justifications of legal you know, criminal punishment of any kind are, for instance, modelled on assumptions about how interpersonal blame, even between friends, is fundamentally retributive. And so they justify putting people in prison and a retributive conception of uh, uh, criminal justice along those lines. Since I don't think that interpersonal blame need be retributive, and it's a good idea if it isn't, I would never uh, think to try and justify retributive practices in uh, the criminal justice system along those lines of analogy. Um, I'm very suspicious of retributive um, ideas, but in a way, um, was it to Columbia has actually made me think perhaps there is a role for retributive aspect in punishment, but that I, what I really believe, again, not pretending to expertise in this, but I really, believe it can't do any good and is basically cruel and horrible unless it is at least accompanied by proper rehabilitative opportunities to move on. And maybe we don't need the retributive bit at all and we should just have the rehabilitative bit, just the reparative bit. And so one of my experiences, for instance, in this recent trip to Colombia, I mentioned a couple of people last night, was sitting opposite, you know, we had many presentations from different different parties, uh, victims and perpetrators, of people taking responsibility of different kinds. And one of the presentations was, you know, kind of, you know, someone who's like, kind of real bad guy. He He's a, actually a war criminal. So, but let me rephrase that. So, Colombian army, the people who are recruited into the army and rise up the ranks, they're not from privileged backgrounds at all. The generals and so on are from an elite. The army in the early 2000s had a body count policy to try and get members of FARC, the communist guerrilla groups, who were doing a lot of bad things themselves in the name of a cause. And uh, this led to this horrendous number of extrajudicial killings because soldiers would just sit around. Their commands would come down from the highest level. It was a policy. And they'd filter down through commanders and then majors. Where are the bodies? Show me the bodies. There aren't enough bodies. And they produced the bodies, and they produced the bodies by killing peasants who weren't FARC members at all. And sometimes they would bother to dress the body in a FARC uniform or trappings of the FARC uniform afterwards, or sometimes they wouldn't bother because it was a body count policy. So soldiers were literally, the dehumanization was so complete that they'd be sitting around saying, oh, there goes a day's vacation, and they kill someone. And they're getting rewards for bodies. Total scandal which was denied for years and Often it was the women campaigning, saying, my son was abducted and never came back. So these are all the huge numbers have disappeared. And uh, eventually, and then the truth comes out, and now it's known, and the acknowledgement, and the criminal justice system got to work, not somewhat 
I don't know if the criminal just the regular criminal justice system got any generals, but there was some. This major, former major Soto, was sitting opposite me, and he had served about seven years of a very long sentence because he was responsible either giving the order or himself pulling trigger for some significant number of extrajudicial killings. And he, uh, I asked him. I said, "You sorry." And then he had the opportunity to join the restorative peace process. So he was actually taken out of regular prison and joined the, the peace process and since he'd already served this number of years which was uh, beyond what he'd have to serve in the reparative system which basically exchanges truth for amnesty except for those who are deemed maximally responsible and they exchange truth for reduced sentences between five and eight years so whereas he was looking at at least another 20 years in uh, regular incarceration, this was his opportunity to come out. And it, I asked him, he's become a very active, very positive member of the JEP process. And I asked him, I said, you're, among other things, in a unique position. You've experienced both justice systems. Is there anything you'd like to tell us about the comparison? And he said, in prison, there was they want, just wanted me to rot and throw away the key. There was no opportunity to think about what I'd done, to think about the victims or process my wrongdoing. And as he put it, you know, um, starting with a bad choice, I was told my commander says, show me the bodies, get me the bodies. Bad choice, I did. I knew I was looking at the end of my military career or do it, something everyone was doing, and I did it, and I wish I hadn't. And he said, by contrast, when he got out and we had the opportunity to join the reparative peace process, it was the first time he had a kind of organized opportunity to, to think about and indeed be confronted by. Uh, I don't know if he was ever confronted by the families of his actual victims. They may never have been able to join those dots. But for instance, talk with surviving family members of people who'd been killed or abducted. And that was the process he needed to go through to take responsibility for what he'd done. And I don't know whether years in prison did anything at all very useful. Maybe it's something, and maybe with crimes that bad, there's a, there are other kinds of way, rationales for it, like it's a kind of performance of, in itself, a performance of a certain kind of reparation, which perhaps could go hand in hand with more, so a constructive, less punitive reparations, like doing something for the community that you hurt and so on. But what has made him confront his crimes morally and really and be able to convert it into something useful has been a reparative process and not a retributive process. So I'll just leave people with that thought. Let's put our hands together for our panel. And again for Professor Fricker. And thank you to Logan Mitchell for bringing Maynard Adams into the room as well. Um, please join us for refreshments right out here in the hallway, and we'll see you back in here in 15 minutes. Thank you.